Well, good morning and uh, welcome to the House of the Lord. And we, um, we come to him and grateful for all he's given us, grateful for a, um, a building, grateful that we have a congregation of people who love each other. And, and uh, we're grateful for a country that where uh, men and women have made tremendous sacrifices to have the freedoms that we have. As we go, we'll uh, go, to, go to the Lord in prayer. We dedicate this service to him, this, this time of worship to him. Um, let's also keep in, keep in prayer um, those of us who are sick um, in our congregation and those of us who are uh, friends and family who are, who are ill. And um, you know, we'll keep in mind, especially um, Jerry's brother, who's um, in the hospital right now, his brother Tommy, who's um, just needs a touch from God. And it's, um, let's, uh, if other ones out who are out there, we're also, we're gonna keep them in prayer this morning and so we can continue on today. But let's, um, let's first, um, let's first uh, just go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we, uh, we come before you this morning. We, we like to set aside this time where we're able to put aside all the, the things that, that are uh, impacting us in the, in the world that are outside these doors where we can focus on you, where we can focus on your goodness and the things that you have called us to, called us to do. Lord, we, uh, we come before you as, um, as humble people, humble children, Lord, and ask you to please just um, bless the service. Let your spirit just reside in this place as we sing these songs and as we, uh, as we prepare ourselves for our a message from you and just attend an encounter with you this morning. Lord, we also just lift up uh, those of us who are sick, fam family members who are sick. Lord, let your uh, healing hand just be on them and on the doctors who are, who are treating you, each person. Lord, we uh, just ask you for this in a, mighty, in a mighty encounter with you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And as we uh, open the service, we have a so Pastor Scott always enjoys us having is a couple of patriotic songs to um, to honor those who have um, who've sacrificed so much, especially as we think of them this Memorial Day. Um, please stand as we sing this first song. <laughs> Till all 
success be known, and every king divine. Oh, beautiful for patriotry that sees beyond the Let's continue praising the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the my rock, he's my fortress, he's my deliverer, in him will I trust, praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's 
my fortress, he's my deliverer, in him will I trust, praise the name of Jesus. Let's sing that one more time. As we uh, go to a time where we will um, continue to worship God with our tithes and offerings, um, if you're here in person and you'd like to, to do so, you can uh, come forward as we start this next song with um, the offering plates here in the front. If um, you wish to do so online or you're watching online, um, you can do that at clintonnazarene.org. close to you never let me go I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm your friend you are my desire No one else will do Cause nothing else can take your place Feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find the way Bring me back to you No. 
time we have a special special guest teacher sarah with the kids connection and kids here can can come forward hi guys good morning so my name is Miss Sarah and I'm Shyla's mom. I don't know if you've ever met me before, but I'm filling in for Miss Melinda who's on vacation. So I have some big shoes to fill, right? Miss Melinda's great with the kids. So this weekend and tomorrow we're celebrating a really special holiday. Can you guys tell me what that is? Memorial Day, right? And what does that mean to you? Why is it important to us as Americans? What are we celebrating? What are we thinking about? People who what? Does anybody know? Yeah. People who fought in the war and people who gave their lives in those wars, right? People who sacrificed their life for our freedom. And um, while we're thinking about these people, we really want to appreciate them this weekend while we're having fun and while we're able to spend some extra time with our families, right? Um, so we also want to remember our um, brave men and women who are currently serving in our military and those who have fought before and are no longer serving. Do we have anybody here with us who used to serve in the military? If you would raise your hand if you've fought or served in one of our branches. So why don't we go ahead and give Mr. Jerry a nice thank you and a wave. <laughs> thank you for doing that for us. So while we're on that topic, can anybody tell me somebody else who died for our freedoms? A really special man. Jesus. Yeah, that's right. So Jesus died for our freedom. So we can have the freedom from what? Does anybody know? What? From sin. That's right. So Jesus gave his life for us as well. So um, when we're spending, like I said, extra time with our families this weekend, we really want to be remembering all of those who have had the bravery to do so. And we get that bravery and we get that strength through Jesus, right? Through the Lord in tough times and when we're anxious. And the great thing about God sending his, um, his son as a human to us is that Jesus was able to experience all of those emotions. So he felt a little bit of anxiety and a little bit of, of worry and a little bit of sadness, the same way that our soldiers do when they have to go away for war. So when we go downstairs, we're going to be talking about a really famous wartime story, and I'm sure you guys have heard it before, of David and Goliath. It's a really good one, um, where David had to really, really rely on the Lord for his strength and for his bravery, right, to fight what seemed to be the impossible fight against a 10-foot giant, right? Okay, so before we go, let's say a quick prayer. Lord Jesus, we come to you today with so much thanks. We thank you for the brave brothers and sisters among us who have fought for our freedoms, who have gone before us. Lord Jesus, we thank you for all who are serving in the military right now and all who have before. And Jesus, we ask you, as we're called this weekend to remember those people, that you continue to call us every day to remind us of the sacrifice that you made for us so that we can have true freedom, and that's freedom from sin. And we ask this in your glorious name. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Amen. Good morning, everyone. We have a few um, announcements. VBS is coming 
and we're continuing. We I sent out an email, I think I did, that said that you can click on this link and it, it asks you to register your email. And then if you start later on to get annoying emails from them that you really don't want, you can stop it. But for just to be able to get into this little contest, which is a giveaway, it's actually pretty significant if we get pulled because it'll give us a $400 packet towards next year's the 2023 VBS and each one of you that goes in it'll count for three for three votes so also coming up is Zoomerang and right now although I haven't really looked again this morning or asked to look again this morning but last time we checked we are at 51 uh, 52 students registered, which means that 71% may be eking a little higher. And that also tells you that if you are aware of anybody that has been saying, oh, I think I want my kids to be there, get them to sign up because there's really not, there's really now only 20 slots left open and the time is rapidly coming. So also, Pastor Scott's been reiterating, and Melinda as well, is that there's you know, any, any donation items that you signed up for that are not perishable, which most of them are not, if you could bring them in as soon as you have them, they'd really like to be in a good position when they get back to understand where we fully are in terms of being ready for that week. And also there is a schedule of the prep events as well as the cleanup that's out there that if you did not receive one last week. Hmm, that didn't come up as well. So. Uh, Mercy Speaks, we've been talking a lot about Mercy Speaks, and one of the things that Mercy Speaks has taken on to do is a baby shower. And this little girl is already in the world. Her name is Scarlett. She's eight months old, and her mommy is Aslan, and Aslan is staying in my home with me right now um, while she kind of figures out what's going on next in her life. So we decided that she never had a baby shower, so we decided that we would do a baby shower for her. And so if you're not a part of the little group that's been communicating on this, but you'd like to contribute in some way, certainly uh, let me know, or one of the ladies within Mercy Speak, Sophia, know what you would like to do um, as a part of that. And if you're a lady and you'd like to come, I mean, who doesn't like a baby shower, right? Amen. And this, in this case, we're hoping that Scarlett will be able to join us, although I'm not certain of that at the moment. That's next Saturday. So it's coming up quick. Also, the teen group on June 12th, which is really not all that far away, and I kind of look at this and I say, the Sipos Farm is going to host a hike, some food, and a fire. And it, it's going to be a good time for them. So that's also an opportunity. I think Dawn's trying to get an idea of a, of a count so we know how many burgers and, and, and hot dogs we need. But if you've got like knowledge of teens that would go to something like this, but maybe not want to come to our um, evening sessions quite yet because they don't know anybody. This might be a good opportunity um, to introduce them to this group of kids, which is a, a great and wonderful group of kids. Right now we're saying five o'clock. We expect that it'll probably run three or four hours. Um, we're firming up you know, the end time so parents know when to pick their kids up. And then also, and this is an early announcement, but we want you to get it on your calendars because things in the summertime get busy. Those of you that have been with us for a number of years know that it's been a couple of years since we've had the advantage of the, the beautiful farm of Phyllis Mason um, for our picnic, but we will be having a swimming party and a picnic on the 14th of August. So mark your calendars now for that so that you don't block something else in instead because we always have a wonderful time of fellowship and it's really beautiful out there. And that's our story this morning. So now we're going to go to the word of God and Johnny's going to read to us. Um, just before I, I read one quick thing I, I would like to just briefly add, um, and I know that I'm going off script here, but I just want to say it's Memorial Day. And um, for me personally, I know that a lot of us right now are thinking about what's going on in the rest of the world. Um, and for, uh, I, 
had this conversation last night with my grandmother and it reminded me of the turbulence that has existed in the past. Um, and one of the things that we need is the word of God in order to stay strong and steadfast during those periods of turbulence, whether that be today or 10 years in the future or a hundred years in the past. So it's just something worth remembering that this really has value. And so for today, we're reading from Revelation. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, right, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich uh, and have become wealthy and have a need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with an eye salve that you may see. <clears throat> as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Heavenly Father, we come before you now to hear a sermon given by a wonderful woman who has yearned after your own heart for many years, who has guided this church throughout tribulation and trial. Please hear, let us listen and absorb what you would have us hear, what you would have us understand. Fill us with your spirit and guide us into the days that follow. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 So we say amen, amen. You can hear a little bit about the guy, amen, this morning. As you've already heard, Memorial Day is an American holiday observed on the last Monday of May, honoring the men and women who have died while serving in the U.S. military. Originally known as Decoration Day, it originated in the years following the Civil War and became an official and became an official federal holiday in 1971. The U.S. Civil War remains America's most deadliest conflict, with the deaths estimated anywhere from 620,000 to an average of 750,000. Certainly these numbers pale in comparison to the loss of lives in other countries during World War I, estimated at 20 million, and World War II, estimated around 85 million, or approximately 3.5% of the world population at the time. People across our nation observe Memorial Day by visiting cemeteries or memorials, holding family gatherings, and participating in parades. Unofficially, it marks the beginning of the summer season. There may be a question for all of us here as we consider the true meaning behind this day that we call Memorial Day. As we go about what appear to be celebration activities or barbecues and family gatherings or a day to just do nothing. In our nation, there is a time, 3 p.m., when we are called to take a moment to be silent. I encourage you not to be complacent with the Lord tomorrow. Stop whatever you're doing and with whomever you are with. Take that moment of silence and take time to pray with one another, 
for one another, for our communities, for our nation, and for the world. Take time to thank our gracious Lord for the freedoms we have and for those who bravely fought hard on our behalf, giving up their lives in doing so. As we know that on this Memorial Day, the war in the Ukraine rages on. Lives have been lost and millions have been displaced. So here today, we honor all who have served and are especially prayerful for the families who have lost loved ones in defense of freedom, life, and liberty. Most of all, we know that the Lord is spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So right here, right now, let us take a moment of silence to lift those people who are suffering in war. And I would suggest that this morning, we lift those people that are in Texas that are suffering from the loss of their children. For that's a war too, a war of good versus evil. And for the families of those who have lost their loved ones in defense of our freedoms, let us also lift to the Lord the gravity of what we are memorializing on this weekend of remembrance. Just take a few moments to silently pray to the Lord. Thank you, Lord, Heavenly Father, for hearing the prayers of our hearts as we desire your kingdom, not the kingdom of this world. We know, Lord, that in this world, war has been a part of humanity's existence since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. We also know that war will continue to rage until you, Lord Jesus, return. We await the day of your return, Lord Jesus, for this is when true freedom will ring. In the meantime, embolden us, help us to no longer be complacent about you or the kingdom work that you have laid out for each of us to do. Many are lost. Let us shine your light to reach them. Amen. The church today, lukewarm, like Laodicea. As we commemorate those who have lost their lives on this Memorial Day weekend, it does seem that it was the Lord's will that we dive into this scripture that comes to us from the writings of the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. A passage of scripture that should prick the hearts of all who call themselves Christian, yet can't definitively say why they believe. They say things like, I believe, God knows I'm a good person. God will understand. Or maybe even, isn't it enough to just say, I believe? Believe what is the question? Let us consider the cause for life, liberty, and the pursuit of freedom for mankind that was fought for in the Civil War, or the cause for life and freedom that was fought for in the Revolutionary War, or the millions that died in the two world wars combined. Today in our country, some of the underlying causes for disunity within the church and within families and within government and across the nation of the world are really no different than what has gone on throughout history. There has and there will be until Jesus returns a battle for the things of God against the things of this world. A culture of life versus a culture of death. Good versus evil the defining of what is right versus wrong even seems to be at odds today. King Solomon wrote the words as recorded in Ecclesiastes 1.9, that which has been is what will be, that which is done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Our passage this morning reminds us that All must choose. There's nothing in the middle. Maybe apathy is the greatest sin of all, like standing by the roadside watching a child running and playing in the traffic and doing nothing. Apathetic, lukewarm Christianity, apathy in the ancient church, apathy in the church today, like Laodicea, 
Let's pause for a moment before we dive in fully to consider some background information about the Apostle John, Revelation, the island of Patmos, and the city of Laodicea. Revelation 1.1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things that must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. Revelation, a beautiful book that concludes our Bible, revealing the divine program of, redemp of redemption as it is brought to fruition. The book is sometimes called the crown of the Bible. It is truly about Christian hope. I have a sweatshirt that says, I read the last chapter, God wins. It should truly say, God's won. We know that God has already won, yet we've not yet reached the full redemption that will come with Christ's return. And therefore, we must take heed to the prophetic words given by Jesus to John to record for us to read, study, learn, and to live by. Words that are intended to give us clarity on what is necessary for salvation. Words that are to bring life to those who believe. The real reason Jesus appeared to John was because he loved them and us here today so much that he wanted nothing left unsaid when it came to calling us to right worship and in turn empowering us to lead others to him while there still is time. And as you see here, John was writing from the island of Patmos as he was in exile. In his own words, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance that are in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and my testimony about Jesus. On Patmos, see it here. A Greek island off the coast between Turkey and Greece. Writings that were penned to paper around the year 95 AD. John was in exile because of his testimony about Jesus. Christians were facing increasing opposition. Patmos was probably the site of a Roman penal colony. Certainly being in exile did not stop the Lord from using John. Please try to picture yourself listening to John speak to us here today as I read to you from Revelation chapter 1, verses 10 to 20, which describes the very direct instructions that John received from our Lord Jesus. Listen carefully as what we're about to hear is happening to John. Use your imagination. You are there. John is speaking to us here today. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see and write in a book and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, or Pergamos, or Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw the seven gold and lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like the son of man, clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace and his voice the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun, shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand upon me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forever. I have the keys for Hades and death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. 
the mystery of the stars you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Imagine that. John saw the son of man, Jesus, the supreme example of all God intended humankind to be, all fullness of deity in bodily form. It is no wonder that John fell to his knees. First and last, Alpha and Omega was right there speaking to John. Seven stars, the angels of the church, and seven lampstands, the churches. Who are the angels of the Lord as represented in our image by seven stars? They are the archangels, representing the fullness of the spirit, the complete will of God. Archangel comes from the Greek meaning chief angels. Angel, archangels are at the top of the angelic hierarchy in terms of power. Created by God, these types of angels have a number of purposes that they fill, lining the Old and New Testament of Scripture. The Bible only names two of the angel of the archangels. One is Gabriel, the messenger angel, and the other is the archangel Michael, the warrior angel. The others are named in extra biblical readings, the book of Enoch, for example. Angels, and particularly the archangels like Michael and Gabriel, are a topic all of their own, one that we'll need to wait for another day. For our purposes here, we just need to understand that a spiritual war rages all around us, but we can rest assured that God has placed angels throughout the world to bring us messages from God and to protect us against spiritual harm. Jesus is saying to John, listen up. This is important. Write it all down. He wants it written down so that we have it. Amen? But that, that, that seven stars, which are seven angels and the seven churches, that number seven, let's just stop for a moment with what we see here with the number seven in just the book of Revelation alone. The book of Revelation is structured in three large sets of seven, the churches, the trumpets, and the bowls, with 49 explicit sets of seven and many more implicit sets of seven. We could spend a great deal of time on the number seven, but if you're interested in digging deeper, you have a handout that gives you the seven sets of seven or the 49 explicit sets of seven, plus many more sevens that are implicit. Study the magnitude and meaning with the view that this number represents completion. And with seven sets of seven explicit ones, there's something to be said about the fruition of the Lord's great promise of a new heaven, a new earth, and for each believer, a new body. Trust that revelation truly is the divine program of redemption as it is brought to fruition. For today, we'll focus on the church addressed seventh in the scripture. <laughs> Do you find it interesting that the Lord led me to the seventh church that Jesus had John write to? I know I do. Our passage follows writings to the dead church and the church in Sardis, which is the church in Sardis, and writings to the faithful church, the church in Philadelphia. The city known in the New Testament as Laodicea, or sometimes pronounced Laodicea, was founded by King Antiochus a Seleucid king who reigned in the middle of the third century before Christ. Seleucid was one of the four empires that split off from Alexander the Great after his death, which is prophesied in the book of Daniel. His grandson was Antiochus IV, the king who destroyed the temple in 221 BC. Suffice it to say that this church was located inside of an evil kingdom. Antiochus II, named the city after his wife, uh, Laodice Laodicea. In the first century, Laodicea was known for its abundant wealth. It had a theater, a stadium, a gymnasium, a public bathhouse, and a medical college connected with the worship of Menkaro, a pagan god of healing who was later assimilated with Asclep Asclepios, the god of medicine. It is also interesting to note that the Hippocratic Oath, the commitment to do no harm, 
that we utilize today originated from this period of time in this area of the world. Hippocrates was a well-known physician who lived in that era. The medical school in Laodicea produced a highly valued ointment for weak eyes. It's interesting, ointment for the blind to be able to see. Most of the city's wealth, however, came from its banking, and Laodicea was so rich that it didn't need any government assistance to rebuild after a devastating earthquake destroyed it in AD 60. Perhaps Laodicea's most prized product, though, was its beautiful black wool, which was unusual because of its brilliant glossy luster. Nearby, Colossae produced a glossy dark violet wool that was equally as stunning. They were both, no doubt, the result of careful breeding. Although these species of dark sheep thrived as late as the 18th century, they're almost entirely extinct. The closest remaining are the Plymouth sheep here in the US, which I've tried to show you those little guys up there. With its enormous wealth, Laodicea stood in sharp contrast with Philadelphia. Philadelphia was small and weak, but had plenty of zeal and was faithful. Laodicea, on the other hand, was wealthy and powerful, but its abundance produced a spirit of indifference and apathy. I heard this morning that there are hot springs there, and the hot springs could never really get really hot. They were just kind of lukewarm, and the cold springs that were supposed to be very cold never were really cold, but were lukewarm. Very interesting point to make when we're talking about a lukewarm church. Spirit of indifference, apathy, the major flaws of this community. It's interesting to note that the Apostle Paul in his letter addressed to the saints and faithful brethren in Colossae requested that his letter be read to the Laodiceans. Of particular note, Paul is instructing in chapter 3, verses 2 and 5, set your minds on things above, not on the things of the earth. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetedness, which is idolatry. As we study onward our passage, we don't see a specific list of sins, but we do see covetedness or idolatry focus on material wealth. That focus very well could have been the root of many others, for Jesus did not have one good thing to say about them, despite all their accomplishments. It's no wonder that Paul wanted them to read his letter to the Colossians, for in Jesus' words, they are truly in the danger zone, at risk of being vomited out of Jesus' mouth. I just say, yikes. Do you think Jesus is serious when he says, you are either with me or you're not? Let's break today's passage into four parts. Verses 15 and 17 give us Jesus's direct accusation. Verses 16, 316 is a righteous warning. Wise counsel comes in verses 18 and 19, and a true and beautiful invitational promise is in 320. 21. Today, we'll focus our attention on the first two, Jesus' direct accusation and Jesus' righteous warning. Next week, we will dig into Jesus' wise counsel and his invitational promise. And to the angels of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. John is instructed to write to the angel of the church. This very same instruction is given for each of the writings to each of the seven churches. Who is the angel of the church? Suffice it to say that Jesus sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Which angel for which is not named? But the message for each is clear. Time is short. Get into righteous relationship with the Lord. The amen, the faithful and true witness is speaking. Jesus is the amen, 
the faithful and true witness and the beginning of God's creation. The amen indicates that he is God's perfect and final revelation. Jesus in perfect harmony with God, the father and the son and the spirit. The, ha the amen, which is steady and unchangeable in all his ways. Amen, meaning it is. When we say amen after a prayer, we are saying we believe it will be. It will be true. And in the use here is the name for Jesus is saying, truly, truly, it is, or truly, truly, it will be. We can trust and believe Jesus Christ because Christ was there in the beginning, and it was through Christ that God made the whole world. This is the only place in scripture where Jesus is named, amen, in revelation, completion, fruition. The apostle Paul in his letter to the Hebrews puts it this way, God who at various times and in various ways, spoken time past to the fathers by prophets, has in these days spoken to us by his son, through who, through who also he, Father God, made the world. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, Jesus is clearly speaking here. Jesus is God's most reliable witness who never swerves from the truth, for he is God. The Laodiceans could take his word to them at face value. And furthermore, Jesus is the originator of God's creation. Without Jesus, there is nothing. Jesus speaks very directly to the Laodiceans. And as we look down the years, we can wonder if they did heed to his warning, or instead we can focus on where we are today and take a transparent look at just how close we are to where they were and listen up. Jesus makes a very direct accusation. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you could be cold or hot, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus knew all of their works, just as he knows ours. That which is done with great zeal and desire, following the Lord's leading, and those which are done for selfish pursuit of worldly reward. Not dead from the worldly perspective, yet neither hot nor cold from Jesus' point of view. Jesus Christ does not have one good thing to say about the current state of affairs in Laodicea. At least in his message to the dead church in Sardis, Jesus said they should be watchful and strengthen the things that remain. It seems the church in Laodicea was so complacent that there was nothing good that remained from the Lord's point of view. They had become wealthy, yet are called miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now, don't get me wrong when I'm saying here that material wealth or wealth that's been provided by the Lord is the issue. It's really not the issue. What the issue is, is when that material wealth becomes the idol, when that material wealth is coveted more than a relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ, a spiritual blindness that couldn't be cured with expensive salve that they had or anything else that money could buy, comfortably lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. Granted, the Lord desires us all to be hot. But lukewarm, people so stuck on themselves and their worldly accomplishment that they miss the heart of their Lord Jesus. We often describe the poor as lacking in the necessary material things of this world, yet spiritually material wealth can bring with it covetousness and idolatry, which in turn creates separation from God and death. It reminds me of the Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale. I assume that you all know this story about two weavers who promise the emperor a new suit of clothes that will be invisible to those who are stupid or unfit for their positions. Well, they, in reality, do not make any clothes at all, and they make everyone believe that the clothes are invisible to them. And when the emperor parades before his subjects in his new clothes, no one dares to say that they do not see any suit of clothes on him for fear 
that they will be seen as stupid. Just want to stop there for a moment. Do we fear say, saying something to somebody that we see doesn't know the Lord because we're afraid they'll think we're stupid? But finally, there is somebody, a child, who unmasks the truth and cries out, but he isn't wearing anything at all out of the mouth of babes. It's no wonder the Lord asks us to be like little children with pure art, hearts and clear eyes. People so focused on the things of this world that they think they need nothing, yet end up walking down the wrong road, naked, blind, unable to see their true spiritual state. They cannot be found in Christ because they never put on the spiritual clothing of Christ, oblivious to their nakedness like that emperor with no clothes. Jesus does not take any of this lightly as he puts forth this righteous warning. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. What comes to mind when you hear 316? One of the most often quoted scriptures in Christianity, that passage, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that everyone who believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's relevant here. It's our promise of eternity. It is why it is the why behind Jesus coming to earth to bring salvation through his death and his resurrection. To better understand what Jesus Christ is saying in Revelation 3.16, we need a solid understanding of what it means to believe. That word believe means to entrust, and trust is an active verb that means not just trust, but total, and in this context, absolute trust in Jesus. So if a person believes in Jesus, that belief goes far beyond head knowledge. It is a total surrender of heart. Now, let me ask this question. If one professes the belief in Jesus described in John 3, 16, does it follow that that belief is incompatible with being lukewarm? Incompatible with focus on riches above God and the things of this world that the congregants in Laodicea were being accused of by Jesus. A lukewarmness that was resulting in Jesus being so sick that he wanted to vomit them out. Now, we might understand better if Jesus was refer referencing evil non-believers. He is referencing those who say they believe, but truly have not entrusted their whole life, and I suggest their riches to him in the way that John 3.16 intends. In the face of conflict, lukewarm Christians will often pick what is popular over what is actually right. They have this deep desire to look good in the eyes of the church, but also in the eyes of the world. They care a lot about how other people see them and less about what God thinks of their hearts and their lives. Lukewarm Christians go where the current of the world is moving, which is not the type of river dwellers we are called to be. We're called to move with the Holy Spirit. Jesus spoke the following words of truth and wisdom. So listen to Jesus's warning in his Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to start with the, the positives in the Sermon on the Mount. Looking at his disciples, he said, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. So Jesus goes on to pronounce the woes. How do you think the Laodiceans would have responded to this next final portion of Jesus' sermon if they'd been in the crowd listening? But woe to you who are rich. For you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, 
for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. We know from our description of the people in Laodicea that they were focused on being materially rich and well-fed and independent and needing of nothing. God was not needed. Spiritually poor and blind, yet oblivious. The focus of a lukewarm Christian, and as we see here, is really no Christian at all. I found the following image that makes the point. Your choice and mine is either God or the world because Satan owns the fence. There is no middle ground. Matthew 12, 30. Matthew 12, 30 says, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. We're to gather with him. We are to be for him. Jesus' words were written down in Revelation with the intent of convicting the hearts of those in Laodicea while there was still time. Yet we know that Jesus did not leave them there, convicted, guilty, sentenced to death, as he had been. For he died for their and our sins and rose and ascended so that we could be set free. For Jesus is the door to life. We can choose his door. We're going to go into that more next week. But for now, let's just close by asking ourselves a few questions. Where do I stand with God? Am I preoccupied with this world? Does the word lukewarm hit a little too close to home? Am I sitting on the fence? Do I or we collectively need to repent? Let us be found zealous. Open your hearts. I recommend that this week that as a community, we study our passage today along with Jesus' description of the other six churches as recorded in Revelations chapter 1 through 3. But just to recap for today and set up for next week, when we'll set our hearts on fire for God. Amen. Jesus made an accusation, and yes, he knows our works, but he wants us not to be cold nor hot in the middle, lukewarm. He doesn't want our riches to come before him. He creates a righteous warning that says, because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. That's not what he wants either. He'll bring us wise counsel and tell us to buy from him gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness may not, may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with salve that you may see. And as many as I love, I rebuke, says Jesus, and he chastens, and therefore be zealous and repent. And then he comes forward to us and he says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens a door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him over I overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. And as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne, on his throne. He who has an ear, that's us this morning. Let's have an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says. What the Spirit is saying to the churches, what the Spirit is saying to us here this morning. If for some reason you should feel the need to speak with Jesus this morning, just know that the altar is always open. Let us pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, there's been a lot here this morning in this message. A lot that either will incent those of us that love you with all of our heart to go and find those that are lukewarm, Lord God, and show them who you really are, Lord, and show them how the material things of this world can never, never, ever replace you, Lord God, that the richness comes from our relationship with you, Lord, and nothing more, for that is eternity, and we will spend eternity with you, Lord, if we just get that. We just get it, that full surrender. We say, come, Holy Spirit, come 
and fill us up. We thank you, Lord God, for this time of teaching this morning. And just as, ask as we go about this Memorial Day weekend, Lord God, we do remember what you have done, Lord Jesus. We do remember the sacrifice that you made so that we could have true freedom, no matter what happens in our country. And yet we pray for our country too. And we say, thank you, Lord Jesus, for those that were willing to give their lives for us as we commemorate on this Memorial Day weekend. It's in your holy and precious name, Lord Jesus, that we lift each and every one here because we believe and we pray. Amen. During the first year of the Civil War, November of 1861, to be more precise, there was a review of troops in Washington, D.C. that were being deployed to Kentucky for battle. And during that review, they sang a, a fighting song that had developed over the years. A lady by the name of Julia Ward Howe was asked, hey, you could rewrite this song, give it new lyrics that reflect the cause of liberty that they were fighting for. It's reported that that night she got the words and wrote them down the next day. Some of those that went were killed, some were maimed, and many more have made that sacrifice since then for our liberties. Could you please rise as we sing the battle hymn of the Republic? Mine eyes have seen the coming and the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage when the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Sounded for the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before the judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be true, let my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory. The beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us live to make men free while God is marching on. Our God. 
believe it, our God is marching on. Amen? Let's say this benediction <laughs> together. Blessed are those who do his commandments. They may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let he who hears say, come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. God bless you all. Have a wonderful day. There's food downstairs. <clears throat> He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, and abide under the shadow of the Almighty. of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty I will say of the Lord he is my refuge my fortress my God in him will I trust I will say